assessment project is an intentional, systematic, and ongoing formative assessment system that gathers evidence of what students are learn specific to math concepts. So I talked about multiplicative is what we're going to be looking at in these three days, but there's also a fraction strand and also a proportional reasoning strand. OGAP is grounded in the math ed research. So I kind of think of about these two hands. So it's about formative assessment. I am going to keep, collect, and understand where my students are in their learning to inform my instruction in a systematic way. And it's grounded in the math ed research on how students learn those concepts. As a classroom teacher, I didn't even say this, I taught third and fourth grade for 17 years first. That's where, that's where my grounding as a classroom teacher was. I always knew what I was supposed to teach, and the programs and the resources had different ways on how to do it. There's really solid research around how students actually, how their brains actually learn these concepts. And those are called learning progressions. And that's a lot of what OGAP is based on. Over Caroline's head is the multiplicative framework learning progression. That's the framework we'll be looking at it a lot. Okay. The OGAP um, project has started in Vermont with a National Science Foundation grant. Um, it's now in Alabama and New Hampshire and Michigan, Ohio, Nebraska, New York. It's actually also been done in um, Jordan. It's had overseas as well. Um, and the, so it's, it's spread. OGAP is uh, based on four guiding principles. You'll hear Caroline and I bring this back up over and over and over again. The very first one is that we build on pre-existing knowledge. So the research is very clear that unless we build on what kids already know to be true, it's somebody's good idea and it doesn't last over time. We need to first know where they are and build on that knowledge in order to have that staying power of understanding. We learn and assess for understanding. So one of the guys that I work with says, okay, you know what, I think I got this now. It's not just that they want them to do mathematics, I want them to think mathematics. So it's being able to do the kinds of mathematics that we need is important, but we are learning and assessing for their understanding of it. And part of that understanding is that flexibility in multiple situations, in multiple contexts, with multiple kinds of numbers. Where, you know, where, does, where are they secure and where does that kind of break down? It's, use, it's using frequent formative assessment. And this research isn't new research. It's just that it's research that happened in the research world and wasn't really used in the classroom world where we all live. You know, where we actually are working with kids and looking at that, it's trying to bring practice and that research together. So using frequent formative assessment, two to three times a week. And we'll talk more about that as we get into this. And it's built on the, the it, it, they build an assessment on mathematics educational research. So part of OGAP is an assessment. We'll talk about that, okay? A pre-assessment, where are they? What do they now know? What strategies are kids now using? How do I, how do I instruct to what they already know? How do I build in those checks to see where they are along the way? Um, and how do I make sure that it's based on what the research tells us about how kids learn that and develop those understandings? So what do researchers say about formative assessment? Why did OGAP pick formative assessment? So it's going to be about content, and the math is research about content and, and learning. But it's also going to be really grounded in formative assessment. Black and William did a study where they like read a whole bunch of studies, 250 different articles and books, and they looked at learning gains for students. And what they found is learning gains from systematic attention to formative assessment are larger than most of those found in any other educational intervention. So people that have been teaching for a long time, for a while now, know that things kind of come and go, this is the new idea, we're doing it this way now, and then, well, now, you know, in two years, no, now this is the way we're doing it. What they found is, when there is a systematic attention to formative assessment, and we'll continue to define that together, those gains in learning are greater than in any other 
intervention. They also found that with many of the studies that they reviewed, not only did it, the system at the gains in learning be greater than anything, it also closed the gap for the lower achievers. So that the, for, the use of formative assessment helped everybody, high, low, in between, but it tended to make that spread between the ones that were really achieving, the ones that were struggling, even closer together. It helped close that gap, raising that achievement for everybody over time. So what? So what is formative assessment? Formative assessment, most of all, is a process that you're gathering evidence to inform your teaching and your learning. When we talk about a process of informing the teaching and the learning, we're talking about the teacher, but we're also talking about the student. In order to be considered formative assessment, the evidence must be elicited, so you have to ask for what you're trying to figure out what they know or not. It has to be interpreted, and then it has to be used by the teacher and the learner. So one of the things about the framework is that it's not just for teachers, it's also for students. I remember myself as a teacher, and particularly working in the middle school, you know, you get into fifth, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh grade, one of our major goals is for kids to own their own learning and be, you know, know where they are in the process. Formative assessment is part of that cycle of making sure they know where they currently are and where they are. So those of you who have been in Philadelphia for a while, you may remember when they came out with the benchmark test, right? And that was supposed to be formative assessment, right? We don't have that on the list. Why not? Why is that not what we're talking about in terms of formative assessment? They were more summative, okay? Summative is sort of like, did you learn it at the end, right? Did it give you a chance to really go back and address what happened? No, I mean, that was the idea, was at the end of sixth grade. If you, if you actually saw it, you didn't always know what was on it, right? So how useful is that information? So, so benchmark testing, although it's, called, it's often referred to as formative assessment, it's more what we would call medium cycle, whereas what, you know, it takes a while. Like the time between when you get that feedback and when you're actually doing the instruction is too far. Like Mary was saying, if you wait too long, it's not helpful, right? So it's good for some things, but it doesn't necessarily give you that information about what do I do tomorrow in class, right? You might know which kids need something, but that's about all you know. So, um, let me say one yeah. other thing. So the other big piece with formative is the idea, the importance of formative assessment is that idea of knowing before the unit's over. Yeah. Okay, so one of the things that has happened to me, I taught a bang up unit on division, they were engaged, they used manipulatives, they were talking to each other, they did all this, I gave the unit assessment, and two thirds of my class like bombed. Anybody ever have that happen? Like it looked good, <laughs> and you get to the end, and you're like, okay, that's not so good, you know? <laughs> the use of formative assessment is to catch it before you're there. How do I know where they are? So when you give that ending unit assessment, I'm not surprised at all by the results. I already have a really good handle on where those kids are along the way. That's the really big idea. It's that assessment that's going to help drive my instruction all the way through so I get to get to the end and go, oh, wow, that's not, you know, I thought Caroline was really big, you know, and boy, she's got these pieces that she's still really cute. This slide, we have a definition of OGAP. And we really tried hard to fit it into one slide here. It's long. What I would like you to do is read this to yourself. Think about what it means. And then go back and pick out what you think the critical words are in this definition. Okay? And I want you to pick out about five or six, no more than six, <coughs> words, single words that you think are real critical.
Table two, another word. Intentional. Intentional. Right? I just used that word, right? So it sort of goes with systematic, right? You're actually doing it with an intent in mind and you're thinking carefully about what information you want to get and how you're going to get it. Table three, another one? Um, research based. Research based. Yes, and Mary talked about that. And it's based upon the research on how kids learn. This isn't just how kids. This is stuff that's been around actually for a long time. Table four. Another word. What's that? Feedback. Feedback. So feedback is critical. If there's no feedback, then it's not formative assessment. Right? And the feedback needs to be both to the teacher and to the student. There's both ways. Another one? Continuous. Continuous. Right, so we don't wait for six weeks to do this. It's ongoing all the time, right? You see that word ongoing in the title. It is continuous. Another one? Modific <coughs> modification. Modification. So once we do the formative assessment, we're actually going to change something. Something's going to change afterwards. We're going to modify, and it's instructional modification, right? So we're going to change the way we teach as a result of that, as a result of that feedback. Do you have another one? Oh, um, well, uh, analysis? Analysis. Yeah. We are going to engage in a lot of analysis this week. Okay, so we're going to actually think about what's there and use frameworks to help us understand that. Okay. Um, I've lost my numbers here. Are we eight over there? Do you, believe? Do you have another word that we haven't said? I'd like to guide. Guide. Okay, that idea of guiding, right? So as a teacher, sometimes you don't know what to do, or a student doesn't know what to do. But this is going to help us guide unit planning, right? What are we going to do next in our <laughs> <laughs> Oh. <laughs> if you leave, you do get to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Table in the back, anything we didn't cover yet? Yeah. Um, based on knowledge. Based on knowledge. Okay, based on knowledge of this math education. And you're going to get that knowledge. Okay? We're going to do a crash course starting today so that you have that knowledge base to build upon. Other ones that we haven't gotten up here yet. Embedded questions. Embedded questions. What does that mean to be embedded? It means that it's fitting into your instruction, right? We're going to learn how to use the curriculum that you have to do this. Now, we are going to give you the extra questions to use. But think about how to embed those. So it's not like, okay, everybody stop. We're doing assessment now. We're doing formative assessment now. No, the kids aren't even going to know. It's part of the daily instruction that's happening. Right? It's embedded within what you're already doing. One thing I want to point out is this blue box over here, okay? So OGAP focuses in the grades 2 to 8 on fractions, multiplicative reasoning, and proportionality. Those topics comprise over 80% of the content that's taught in grades three to five. And that's even more, and now with the Common Core, these are the topics that really need to get focused on, right? Those are the big um, focal points. We're going to talk about this idea of learning progressions. You may have heard the term learning trajectory or learning progressions. And we're just going to talk about what that means and how that fits into OGAP. So the Common Core standards, we're built upon progressions, but they're built upon what's called a standards progression or standards trajectory. So if you look this, I yeah, know you can't read this, but this is um, the common core standards showing at each grade level how different topics build upon one another. So if you've done any work actually looking through the common core, you may have noticed that, that actually they're very intentionally, not just what needs to get covered at the end of third uh, by third grade, but so how does what gets covered in third grade lead into fourth grade, lead into fifth grade, lead into sixth grade? Those are called standards progressions. So they thought about what kids need to know and made a clear progression through the grades when they created the Common Core. So that's about what kids need to know and come to understand, right? And those are in a progression. There are also some documents called the progressions for the Common Core State Standards. I don't know if any of you have seen those, but those detail this and sort of think, you know, talk about why those are, are built that way. Okay. But in OGAP, we use something called a learning progression or a learning trajectory. And the difference is that first word, right? We're not talking about standards, we're talking about students learning. 
So how does students' learning develop over time? And that's, 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 you know, here, how do we sort of measure, how does that learning progress over time, and then how do we use that to inform instruction? So here's, again, a diagram of a standards progression. If you look at the Common Core, these are the big topics. They start with additive reasoning in the early grades, and then in the grades three to five, where you guys are, we're sort of focusing on multiplicative reasoning and fractions, and that turns into proportionality, the number system, equations, and expressions in middle school, so that by high school we're doing functions and calculus. So that's how the Common Core is built. That's a standards progression. What OGAP does is takes one of these areas, multiplicative reasoning for this year, and breaks that out and says, okay, how do kids learning in multiplicative reasoning develop over time? How do kids come to understand? What does the research say? And the progression starts with where they start and build up towards more sophisticated knowledge. So another definition, learning progressions are careful, empirically based descriptions of the ways in which students' conceptions and skills actually grow. So there's been a lot of research done watching kids and interviewing kids and seeing how they actually learn these concepts. And that's what gets put in the learning profession. The other thing that's important is, depending upon the strength of multiplicative reasoning, students may move back and forth between using multiplicative, transitional, additive, and non-multiplicative strategies. That'll all make sense by the end of today. <laughs> As they interact with different problem structures and problem situations. Okay, so what does that mean? That means that it's not just a straight ladder that kids go up. You know, it's not a linear, you go from here to here to here to here to here. It would be nice if that were the case. But learning is messy, right? And what kids shows you one day, they might not show you the next day. And maybe they show it in one context, but you give them a different word problem about something else and they don't. They use a totally different strategy. Okay, so what we find is there is a general progression that kids move through, but there's a lot of back and forth that happens too. So there's, you know, a little moving back and forth between the levels as this knowledge grows and deepens. Okay, so that's important to remember. It's not just a lockstep sequence, hey, you made it to stage two today. Right? You're going to kind of be working between the stages for a while. And then your knowledge gets deeper and grows over time. So again, kids will move back and forth. And we'll talk more about that and how the problem context and problem structures interact. So most importantly, multiple researchers have found that when teachers get introduced to this and come to understand this research, it has positive impacts, both on student learning and on teachers learning. So it's really important. This research has been out there for a while, but it hasn't really been put in a form that's useful for teachers. Okay, so most of the curriculum that you're using is built upon this research. The people who wrote the curriculum looked at that, but they didn't bother to put it in the curriculum for teachers. Right? They said, oh, they don't need to do that. We'll just tell them what to do. Right? What we found is that actually engaging in that, knowing that as a teacher allows you then, right, it makes sense, to make the day-to-day -day decisions you need to make. It helps you. You're, in, you're the ones interacting with the kids. You need to know that information. Okay, so it has positive impacts on instructional decision making, selection of instructional activities, classroom discourse, right, the kinds of talk that goes on, and understanding evidence in student work. So there's been research to show this. It also positively impacts student motivation and achievement. So those, that's our, those are our goals, really, in doing, that's why we're doing OGA. That's why we're spending three days on and an entire year of support. This slide sort of um, summarizes what OGAP is. OGAP is bringing together that idea of formative assessment that Mary just went through with you. What is you know, formative assessment with this idea of learning progressions? So it brings them together. And imagine, yeah, that would really help if you are continually assessing kids and knowing what that should look like over time, it's much more powerful. And that leads to increased student. Also planning a fall follow-up, that's probably not going to happen until election day. Um, that's what we're working on, since there aren't a whole lot of PD days before then, like none. Um, 
But there will be a fall follow-up at some point where we continue because this isn't just we do it and then you go off. All year, you're going to be using OGAP to make instructional decisions to support your student learning. So that's ongoing during the school year. But we know that you're going to need support while doing that. So there's ongoing support in the form of bi-weekly, which actually we've been told means the wrong thing. Every other week, right? Every two weeks. Not twice a week. Not twice a week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Different people have different definitions of what bi-weekly means. But every two weeks, you'll have grade level team meetings. And you probably already have those in your school, but they're going to be different. They're going to be OGAP team meetings where you're supporting the implementation of OGAP, facilitated by your teacher leader or your coach or whatever you call it in your school. Um, but that's a specific kind of, of grade level meeting. Mostly you're going to be looking at your student work together in the way that you learn how to do in these next three days. But you're also going to be continuing some of the PD for OGAP we're not going to get to in these three days. You'll continue to do that in your grade level meetings. Okay, so that's a really powerful thing, that chance to meet with your grade partners and actually do real professional work during the school day. And it's going to be protected time. Your principals have agreed. <laughs> you laugh at that. <laughs> We're going to work with your, you know, your principals have agreed to give up that time, to have that time in place. So that, because we know this is necessary. And then finally, for teachers, Leaders, there's ongoing support during the year, some face-to-face -face meetings with the OGAP team, and also virtual meetings to help you implement that in your schools. So that's kind of a big picture of how things work. This happens this year in multiplicative reasoning, and then the same thing happens next year when we add on fractions. Okay, so you also are aware that this is part of a research project. The way we got the funding for this project was to go to NSF and say, hey, we well, you know this really great program, it's got lots of good results, it's been implemented in lots of places, it builds on all the right research, all the things we know works, and we want to do it on a large scale and see what happens and, and learn more about it, okay? So the research part of the study, and that's why NSF gave us the money, right? Because they, they want the development, but they also want the research to go along with it. Um, we want to know the impact of this. In a systematic way, we want to collect the, um, information about the impact on how the knowledge in your school have learning progressions and formative assessment impacts both teacher's knowledge as well as student knowledge and the kinds of actions that teachers take. We know for, Mary talked about, we have all this evidence that formative assessment works, but we haven't really gotten information about what that means to work. What do teachers actually do in the classroom when they're doing formative assessment? What does that look like? What are the more effective ways to do that? Okay, so that's the kind of knowledge we want to uh, get from the research part of the project. What evidence are we collecting? Well, you already know about the teacher survey, right? So it says two different types here, but there's actually just one survey. There were two surveys kind of blended into that one that you already took. Um, that will happen in the spring of every year. So you've already done one. At the end of next year, you'll do another. Okay. For student knowledge, what are we collecting? Well, first we have PSSA results, and we'll be able to look at those. But we don't really feel like that's the best measure of what's going to happen in OGAP. <laughs> you probably agree, right? It has some information, but it's not going to give us exact information on kids' multiplicative reasoning. So there is an OGAP assessment that we're going to ask you to give in the beginning and end of each year. Now the really cool thing is, and we'll talk much more about this, the beginning assessment that you give is part of OGAP. It's the OGAP pre assessment. We would have asked you to give anyways. Okay, so it's actually not an extra thing that we're tagging on, it's what you're going to use to guide your unit planning. It's the same assessment. It's a pre-assessment. Your kids aren't even going to really realize that they're taking another assessment. At the end of the year, we're going to, and we'll talk about how that's going to work. Um, at the end of the year, we're going to ask you to give the same thing. It's six questions, six or seven questions. 
open-ended word problems that kids do, and we're going to ask you to administer that to your kids and give us the actual tests. We de-identify everything before we get it back out of the school. So we'll actually come to your school and there's a whole process in place to de-identify those tests. So students are just identified by numbers and we have that information at Penn only in the form of numbers. Student, no student names attached to their work. Okay. But the cool thing about that is we're actually not just looking at whether students get things right or wrong, but how they're doing it, what strategies. And that's something that really hasn't been done before in terms of measuring student knowledge. We're also collecting some evidence through something called the e-tool, which you'll learn to use. when you. The reason you're getting iPad minis is not just as a little parting gift, but it's actually, <laughs> <laughs> although maybe it did entice you to come, I don't know. But um, that is actually a tool you're going to use in the classroom to implement o OGAP, because we have an app on that iPad that's going to help you use OGAP and we call it the e-tool, for lack of a better name. Um, and so th that, and it, as you get to know the e-tool, you'll have a better sense of it, but the information we have from that is sort of what you're doing with the e-tool as a teacher. What, how often you're using it, what kinds of questions you're choosing, what kinds of information you're reporting and decisions you're making. It's not, that it's not collecting information about particular students or how your students are doing, and we'll talk more about that. But it is, again, sort of de-identified data um, that we get back at Penn. Can I say one other thing? Yeah. That? It also doesn't identify, like, is Mary using it a lot? Is right. she, are her kids doing good because she's, you know? So it's also not evaluative of you as a teacher. Right. Because otherwise, why would you put bad data in there? Right. It's gonna, we want to see how, it's really about how teachers are using it. Yes. It's not, it's, so that it's not evaluative at all, and we'll talk more and more about that, of you as a teacher in your classroom. And you'll see this when you get the e-tool. Nobody else has access to that information at your school, not your grade partners, not your principal, to make sure of that, okay? Or anybody who's in any kind of evaluative position cannot get in and see your data, okay? So that's different. It's not school net, okay? <laughs> it's not school net. It's a tool for you to use for your teaching. And what we're interested in is how you're using it, whether or not what parts are most useful. So last thing is, this is what's called a randomized control trial which is what's considered the gold standard in research, and it's very hard to do in education. Um, but we actually recruited 60 schools to be in this project, and um, then 30 were chosen randomly out of, in the lottery. So you guys are winners. Because <laughs> you get OGAP, and you get the iPads. <laughs> there are 31, that number's wrong, there are 31 control schools who didn't get OGAP. Um, we're still taking the surveys, we're collecting the same student test data from them, okay? Obviously, we're not collecting the e-tool data from them because they don't get the e-tool, right? But they're doing the same things and they don't get OGAP. They do get compensated in other ways, but not, um, they don't get the actual professional development. As I said before, there are schools from the School District of Philadelphia, there are charter schools, and um, we have 10 schools from Upper Darby. Just an overview, this doesn't, I think, make much sense to you at this point, but just so you know how um, OGAP professional development is actually consists of 13 different what we call sessions, okay? And we'll be doing several sessions in one day. So today we're doing sessions one and two and three, right? Okay. Um, tomorrow we'll work on four. It doesn't go exactly in order. Okay, we will skip some because we can't do all, we would probably have to be here five or six five days, days, five full days if we were going to do this. So we've chosen ones that we think are particularly important to do now, and then the ones that we don't hit, you actually will have all the materials for that, you have them in your binder and you'll have them on your iPad, and your teacher leader can continue to do follow-up training on those throughout the year. Those will sort of get built in. Um, but this is, you know, sort of we start with, some sessions on the research and the framework on learning progressions, and then we get into evidence and instructional decisions.